have an application that's actually operational, let's see what the scaffold generator did to make all this possible. I scrolled up into the terminal window and here in the console it shows us what files were created. It also shows what modules were brought in to make that file generation possible. So let's start at the very top, take it one at a time. You can see it right here it says invoke. It invoked Active Record. Active Record is a module that Rails uses to handle connections with the database and has a lot of different uh, functionality associated with running database queries, with changing the structure of the database. In this case, it invoked it so it could create this migration file right here. So it automatically knew to call it create projects. So it created a file for us and this file, uh, it even gives a path to it. So if you look inside of your DB folder inside a new folder called migrate, you'll see this file right here. And I'll even switch to it just so you can see I'm not lying. DB migrate click here, and this is the file it created. You may also notice that it put some content in here for us. It gave us a title attribute, a description, and a percent complete. And you can see it also gave respective data types for each one of those attributes. And for free, it threw in this timestamps uh, attribute. So this gives us a created at and a updated at value in the database. That is going to be the case for every different uh, scaffold and model you generate. You don't have to do anything. It gives it to you automatically. And it also has the functionality in there as well. So when you create a new record, it will give you a date and time stamp for when that record was created. And when you update it, when you edit it, it'll update that record so that you can always have kind of a, a frame of reference for that. Okay, so that's what it did, and it also created a project file, and this is a model file. You can get to it through app, models, project.rb, and right now it won't have anything in it uh, because we haven't written any code in there. Uh, it doesn't need a code in the model file in order to work because the uh, controller is actually what's handling all the logic right now. The next thing it did, it brought in test unit, and unless you skipped the, uh, the mini test module when you created the application, it's going to automatically create some kind of templated tests right here. So it's going to create a project test for a model, your model tests, and then it's also going to create a fixture. Uh, I rarely will use mini test. I usually use RSpec, like I've mentioned before. And so I usually I'll skip this over completely, but it does, it's good to know that it does create a form of tests for you. It doesn't write them from scratch or do anything like uh, build your real tests. It more kind of set some placeholder files where you could write all your tests. And that's the case whether you're using mini test or if you're using RSpec. Uh, nothing out there has been created yet that uh, really can write your test for you. So next thing it does is it brings in resource route. And so this is adding a route to our, uh, to our file. So uh, if you go into the routes file right here, you can see at the top, it's automatically placed resources projects. Now what this does is it lets uh, the application know that there is going to be all of the different RESTful interfaces or RESTful uh, type of uh, routes for the projects module. So that means they're going to have a new and a create method and a destroy method and all the different things that we already saw. When you do resources, this packages it all up for you very nicely. Uh, before they had this, you had to manually do each one of these and it made for a much longer file. And since I'm here, I'm going to get rid of all these comments because they're kind of annoying. Hit save and uh, this is all you need in the routes file. Now the reason why I put it in here, if the routes 
file does not know about projects here, we wouldn't have been able to go to projects in the browser. This is what lets us know that we could go to localhost 3000 slash projects and it would know exactly where to point us to. Okay, so that's our routes. Now, next thing it did is it created a controller for us and this is where it put in the majority of the code. So if I go to projects controller, you can see even though we didn't actually write any code, all of this code was created for us and it actually follows for the most part Rails best practices and things like that. So uh, it does a lot of really cool code for us. You can see it creates a controller, it inherits from the application controller, and if you're not familiar with object-oriented programming, all it means is that projects controller has all of has access to all of the different public methods available through the application controller. So a lot of the things that, uh, for example, a good example would be this before action. This is a method, and this method is available to us because it's inheriting from application controller. Uh, I'm not. 100% sure if before action comes from application controller, there's probably a parent class that actually owns that, but it's only available to projects controller because it inherited from that. Um, so, it, and it comes with a lot of different methods besides just that one. Uh, in here, uh, we'll get into what a lot of this does later on. Uh, this before action means that it's calling this set project before every method. So before every one of these methods, and it says which ones it's for, so only show, edit, update, and destroy, it calls this method of set project. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see we have a private method here called set project. And a private method in Ruby, all it means is that uh, for the most part, this method can only be called by this particular file. There are plenty of ways around that because Ruby is so flexible. Uh, however, it's considered kind of a bad practice to go against your own code. So uh, you put methods here that you wouldn't want any other file calling. So it wouldn't make any sense for another controller or some other file to call set project for, uh, for this because uh, it would really be outside the scope of what that other file would be doing. So, um, so this creates all the different methods and you can even see some of the functionality we saw such as being able to create notices. So when we, in this create method right here, you remember when we created the, uh, one of the projects, it added this little notice to the top of the screen. And this is where you can do that. This is also where you can customize it. So you could do something like say, a new project was successfully created. Hit save, and then you'd be able to uh, have, that would automatically show up on the screen. And so this is, uh, this shows a lot of the code that's written uh, through the controller file. Okay. So now I'm going to keep on going down the line and see all of the different views that were created. So it created an index, an edit, a show, a new, and then a form. We can switch back and see all of those. So if I go to app, views, projects, I created this projects directory as well, you can see all of these files right here. Now this underscore form, if that looks kind of weird, it's because uh, whenever you use an underscore in front of one of your views, Rails interprets that to mean, to mean that you want to use this file as a partial. And what a partial is, is it's a file, it's a view file that can be called by other files. And you may wonder why you'd want to do that. And it's actually really a cool thing that Rails does and it's a, a common practice. We have an edit form like you saw and we also have a new form. But you notice if you go to these, you're not actually having any real form in there. All the form code is right here in this form partial. And the way this works is project or new and edit both want the same exact form. They may want to have some different validations or there may be a few things that are slightly different, but for the most part, 
the form is going to be identical. So there's no reason to create a edit form and a new form. Instead, just use a single form and then call it from those two files. And when you see this, uh, this line of code right here, this render form, this is going to call the partial right there. And using partials and uh, seeing code like this where uh, we're not duplicating code, this follows a very, very important principle called the dry principle. And with the dry principle, it's don't or do not repeat yourself. This is something you're going to hear a lot as you do uh, Rails work, and it's not specific to Rails. It's a good common practice for pretty much any kind of programming or any kind of development. A good example of why you wouldn't want to repeat yourself for something like this is, say, our project module started to grow and instead of just a title and a description and a percent what if we wanted to add five other different parameters and maybe we wanted to do that at different times throughout the application development process every time we added a new parameter we would have to go if we had a edit form and a new form we'd have to go into each one of those files and duplicate that code. And so we'd have say that we wanted to have a user column or a company organization column. Uh, then we'd have to go and write all of that, not just in one form, but also in another one. And then there's always a chance you could have a typo. There's a lot of other things that can go wrong when you're doing identical work in multiple places so it's a lot of practical reasons why you wouldn't want to repeat yourself and rails has different constructs such as the partial that lets you be really really good with being able to uh, to call different files from other places in your application okay so that shows our views now we also have some other tests that were created. You notice up top, you, you may wonder why we are invoking test unit again when we called it up here. And the reason is because these are model tests and down here we have controller tests. We also have a projects helper file that was created and you can go to app helpers projects helper and access that one. Those are view helpers. So if you add any different types of custom methods, so something I use view helpers for a lot are uh, different enumerators. So if I have a collection of uh, states or zip codes or something like that, that I don't really want to create a database table for because I don't want to have to query the database every single time that that page would load, then I can put a view helper and put some different things inside of there. And then I can call that instead of having to make a database query or, you know, something uh, on that side of the world that could slow down the application. So the helpers can be very helpful. Uh, then uh, we also call test unit again, and then we have some things that help us out if we were building an API. Rails is an incredibly friendly framework for building APIs. In fact, right out of the box, a lot of the things that even we just created have the ability to function as an API. So if you wanted to have an application that communicated with an iPhone app and you wanted data to transfer between your app and that iPhone app, then you would, with a regular framework, or with most frameworks, it would take a very long time to build out that API so you could pull in that data in something your app could read, uh, such as JSON. With our app, all we have to do is call JSON on that view and or, or on that path I should say and then it will return all of those different things that we just asked for so in this case projects it would turn all the projects in JSON format and it does that automatically and that's what some of these things like these JBuilder files right here uh, help us accomplish. 
It also has assets, uh, different assets that it creates for us too. So if you wanna have custom JavaScript for that specific page, then you're able to put it inside of this project's CoffeeScript file. Now, if you are not familiar with CoffeeScript, don't worry, uh, there's a ton of people, especially people who are uh, not familiar with Rails, uh, who really haven't got a lot of experience with CoffeeScript. All it is is a, a different way, essentially like almost like a rewritten way of JavaScript. It's not really a rewritten form of JavaScript. It compiles into JavaScript and it makes it a little bit easier to read. And it also gives some ways of treating JavaScript more uh, as a object oriented language, as opposed to kind of like the prototype driven language that it is. And so it gives you a file right here where you can access it. It also gives us a uh, projects C, uh, SCSS file. This is where you can put your custom styles. And you may wonder why you'd want to have all this generated for you each time. And the reason is for this side of it is because if you have a style that you only want showing up on the projects page, then you wouldn't want to put that into a master CSS file. It'd make a lot more sense to have one file dedicated just to that page. And so this is how it works. It's a lot more organized. And then last but not least, it also creates a scaffold uh, file. I have no idea why it does this because I've never had an application that ever used this as a style sheet. It gives some kind of ugly styles, but uh, I always just wipe it out, which we will do eventually as well. So that is everything that the uh, scaffold generated. Now, if you had any issues with that, uh, or with uh, your application not running the way that I showed you, make sure you run rake db migrate because uh, if you have not updated the database schema, then this isn't gonna work because you need to have your schema file updated. And if I come back here and go to schema, you can see that it's updated now with uh, the projects table with all the different attributes. When I ran, ran the scaffold, this still was not here. Uh, the scaffold does not uh, update the database automatically. Only running rake db migrate would do that. So that's a reason why we had to do that in order to get it up and running. So you should now have a really good idea of everything that the scaffold generates, which also will help you later on when you're wanting to do something a little bit more manually or only using one type of generator. Uh, it'll give you some background on knowing what the scaffold does because when you're doing it manually, you're gonna be doing a decent chunk of that work but by yourself. So uh, great job if you went through that and I'll see you in the next video.